Welcome back to Quantitative Analysis in Anthropology. I'm Professor Peregrine. And today we're on Topic 3, Lesson 3, talking about sampling. This is a really important lesson for understanding how we do statistics. But, like the last lesson, a lot of this is going to relate more to when you're actually doing research projects and you have to implement some sampling techniques in order to be able to do your project well. But there are concepts that play into statistics that we need to go through and that's what I'm going to try and focus on. Once again, this is conceptual. When we get into sampling, uh, this is where probability really comes to the fore. We've already seen it with the normal curve, but what we're not doing in here is getting into the probability aspects of sampling because that gets very mathematical and we're not doing math in here we're doing conceptual and visual uh, understanding of statistics so before we get into sampling we have to think about what it is we are going to sample what are the cases that we're going to sample out of a population to create the sample. And those we call the units of analysis. A very basic unit of analysis is an individual. But even with an individual, we need to think about what is the population from which that individual is going to be drawn. The question there is, what are you studying? So let's say we're studying undergraduate students at Lawrence University. Okay, that seems like a pretty clear population of individuals from which to draw a sample. But, is it? Because if we think of students at Lawrence University, are we talking about full-time students or part-time students? Are we thinking about students who are coming in from the community to take one continuing education class or just undergraduate students who are getting who have not yet earned a degree and are taking their courses towards you know that first degree are we talking about students living on campus or students who are off campus what about students who are studying abroad are they included in Lawrence University students? What about students who are on a leave of absence? And you can see how these questions all become complicated. What is it when we want to study Lawrence University students? What is it that we're actually talking about? Um, at Lawrence, we have something called Census Day, which is an artificial day where we just say, on this day, how many full-time students are enrolled at Lawrence University no matter where they are. And that's what we take as the population of students. Students taking more than 15 credit hours who are enrolled in classes now, recognizing that some of them are going to drop out or drop classes and drop down to being uh, not full-time enrollees. And so one of the things to recognize really is that although we're talking about populations, in reality, we never have a real pop. There's no such thing as a real population unless it's very carefully defined or narrowly defined. It's always something artificial. So we're always dealing with samples. And that's really important to consider that we're always dealing with samples. We create an artificial population through a careful definition and then we take a sample from it. Uh, that conceptually can be hard to think about, but in terms of there being, in anthropology at least, some natural population, it's always defined. And so, we want to carefully define the units that we're analyzing, and then we want to carefully define what we're calling a population. From that, carefully defined population, then we sample. And we might ask, why sample? If we're interested in 
Lawrence University students, why not just talk to all of them? Because the reality is that we don't have the time or money to do that. And in practice, even if we carefully define the students that are here on Census Day, some of them might have left by the time we get around to talking to them. So talking to a whole population or studying an entire population is usually impossible. What we have to do is take some careful subset of that population and, and do the study or gather data about them. There's a lot of concern or talk in statistics about population sizes, and we're going to be talking about that in the course as we move on. We're not going to worry about that right now, but population size does matter. And typically, what we try and do is to get a 10% sample of a population at least. We'd like more, but a 10% sample usually matches a population of some size, greater than three or 400. 10% sample usually matches it pretty well. And this is my rule of thumb, but I think it's a pretty good one for an anthropology. You need at least 30 cases to kind of get anything. Okay. We always work with samples. So samples. What is a sample? Well, it's a group of cases that are taken out of a population, what makes for a good sample or a useful sample or a sample that we can actually analyze is that it matches the mean and standard deviation of the population from which it was drawn. And that's why we want to define the population clearly so that we can get a mean and a standard deviation that we expect from the population. From that, we're going to sample. And we want to get a good sample that matches the mean and the standard deviation. And again, a good 10% sample should be able to do that. And I would say as long as it contains at least 30 people. All right, so here's a population. See the little sample? It matches the mean and standard deviation. That's what we want. Typically, the bigger the sample, the better the approximation of the mean and standard deviation. But again, a 10% sample can be pretty good, as long as there's at least about 30 people in it. Again, that's my rule of thumb. But I think in my, in my practice of research over the past almost 30 years, been pretty good. Okay. Sampling. Done that. We're going to come back and talk about how you actually get a good sample in just a minute. And we are back. So, we've talked about populations and made the point that they're always kind of artificial. You need to define your population well. And from a population, you draw a sample. And a good sample matches the mean and standard deviation of that population. So we're going to talk about then how you actually get a good sample. And the way that you do that is through what are called random samples. It is the only way to ensure a good sample is to take a random sample. The most basic way of getting a random sample is what is called simple random sampling. However, it isn't as simple as it seems. In simple random sampling, what you do is you give a number to every member of the population and then you use a random number generator to select individuals out of the population. Recognize that there's kind of a problem there because the population 
needs to be carefully defined and in fact you rarely know the entire population of interest so there is a little bit of a problem there but if you define your population very carefully then you can assign a number to each member of the population and then randomly choose them and use a random number generator um, in R there's a random number generator some programs, statistical programs, will actively choose cases for you at random. And in fact, you can do that in R. So that's one way to do random sampling. The other way is to do what's called systematic random sampling. And in systematic random sampling, you have all of the members of the population of interest, and you give them a number. And then you take a random start, which you can get just by rolling a dice, or you can use a random number generator, and then a random interval. You can do this by rolling a dice or using a random number generator. And so let's say your, your um, random start is three, and your random interval is three. You start at case that you've numbered three, and then you take case six, nine, 12, 15, and so on until you've gotten the size of the sample that you want. And again, 10% random sample usually proves itself to be pretty good in approximating the mean and standard deviation of a population as long as you take about 30 cases, which means you need a population above 300 to do that. And again, that last part is my own rule, but I think it works pretty good. Systematic random sampling tends to be way easier than simple random sampling, um, especially in small populations, it's pretty easy to do. But there is one drawback, and that is if there is periodicity in the data so that there is some kind of periodic behavior and you happen to hit that systematically with your systematic sample. Um, <clears throat> there's a classic case, although it may be apocryphal, in an archeological context where a person or a group laid out a grid, gave a number to, over an archeological site, gave a number to each unit of the grid, and that grid was their population. And then they did a systematic random sampling of that grid. What apparently happened is that there was a, an organization of the community that was laid out regularly, and what the sample did was systematically miss every house. So it looked like that community had no houses in it, even though they knew they had houses. Uh, that can happen in a systematic random sampling. And by the way, that grid, that's a nice example of creating a population. That's your population. The, all the units in a grid you've laid out over an archaeological site. If you have a, a bunch of specimens, you're a physical anthropologist and you have a bunch of specimens of something, that would be your population, and then you sample from that. So anyway, so simple random and systematic random sampling are the only way to ensure that you have a good sample. They're very hard to put into practice, especially in anthropology, so what do we do? Well, we do non-random sampling, and we know that we don't have as good a sample as we think we do, or, or as we would, sorry, with random sampling, and so what we know we have is error. We hope that error is random. It might be systematic. And we hope it's random because that tends to just muddy things. If it's systematic, it could actually create a pattern that isn't true. And we might not be able to identify what that systematic error is. That's the, really wor the real worry with non-random sampling is that we're going to get some systematic error 
that we don't recognize and so we'll end up with a mean or that's higher or lower or standard deviation that doesn't match the population of interest cannot ensure a good sample all right the most common form of sampling is what's called grab bag sampling and so the classic example is you have a sock drawer with lots of different colors of socks you reach in you grab a color out reach in grab another color out reach in grab another color out all right there there's one problem with that which is that you're not replacing the socks every time so that there's not an equal chance of getting every case in systematic or simple random sampling the cases are all out there and you're picking and so you can hit the same case twice you just don't use it again here if you're not replacing then every time this is the probability aspect of sampling every time uh, you change the the, po the probability that any given case is chosen. And that's in, in sy systematic and simple random sampling. What those do is ensure the, the same possibility of every case being chosen. However, grab bag sampling also has a strong likelihood of sampling from only one part of a population. So if you're doing socks, you're grabbing from probably from the ones on top. And there are cases, some famous cases, where grab bag sampling has created really poor samples for that reason. In fact, one of them is the Vietnam draft early on, where there was a systematic grab bag error to it so that people were being sent off to their death, essentially, with a non-random, with, with an error, particular groups. Uh, born in particular months got sent off. Snowball sampling is maybe even worse than grab bag sampling in terms of not being able to ensure a good sample. And again, a good sample matches the mean and standard deviation of the population. In snowball sampling, you go out and you find somebody with characteristics of interest or the, in that population you interview them or whatever, and then you ask them for another person to talk to, and you go and find them. Similar vein, you might have an archaeological site of interest, study it, and then you look at what's referenced as other sites, and then you go and look at them. It's called snowball sampling, because it kind of snowballs. Snowball sampling is ripe for systematic error because you're going down a particular path that started by the first piece of your snowball and then keeps getting directed in one way. Snowball sampling is a really easy way of sampling, uh, and so it's used a lot, especially in student projects. And you know, that's okay, but you have to recognize that there's high likelihood of systematic error in a snowball sample. Another sampling technique that's used often is what's called opportunistic sample or sampling. And what that is is you take what's available. You've got a bunch of ethnographies. You're going to do some comparative study. These are the ethnographies that are on your shelf. You use them and you do your study based on that. You want to study a group of Lawrence University students. These are the students in your classroom. You use them. Opportunistic samples are used all the time. They can have systematic error because that opportunistic group might be, if it's in a class, those are the students interested in anthropology or in physical anthropology or in uh, peoples and cultures of Southeast Asia or something like that. So you'd have a systematic bias of those kinds of people. Even without a systematic bias, opportunistic sampling is going to have lots of random error. So with random error, it makes it harder to see patterns. So these are none of them very good. They're ripe, especially grab, grab bag, and particularly snowball sampling, ripe for systematic error, opportunistic sampling you have to start out with the knowledge you're going to have 
random error, and you could have systematic error. All right, there's some refinements that you can make to sampling to make life easier or to try and ensure a better sample if you really can't get a good random sample. One of those is called clustered sampling. This is used a lot in archaeology. It's also used in survey research where you're going out and talking to people in a survey. And so here's a, a spatial example of clustered sampling. And I hope you can see this well enough, but what you've got here is a drawing of a bunch of houses in a little community. House, 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 house. All right? So let's say we're going to random sample this. We've given a number to each of these houses, and we're going to take a simple random sample of three. And our simple random sample, the random number generator, chooses this house, and then that house, and then this house. So that's what we're going to sample. Now in the real world, we have a big sample, and it might be spread out across a whole country or a whole city. And even here, you'll look and see, here's this house. This one's way, way far away from it. And then this is a river. You've got to cross the river and come way down here to get to this other house. Well, in practicality, you may not have the time or money to do that. What you might want to do is to cluster together a group of houses to get your three cases. And so what you might do is randomly select this case first. Again, the same thing. But then, as part of your sampling protocol, say, and I'm going to take the two nearest houses to that one, which would be this house and that house. That's going to be my cluster. I'm going to start with a random assign, randomly assigned house, and then I'm going to take the two that are nearest to it. All right, this is going to create some random error. It could also create systematic, systematic error if these people live together in proximity because they have similar characteristics. But if you're doing really a big survey of some kind, you almost have to cluster it because you can't go out and see, you can't be running all over the place. You can't be going out and finding people all over campus if you're doing uh, uh, something like doing a sample of Lawrence University students. Okay. The other find, uh, refinement that you might make to sampling is called a stratified random sample. And so here is a distribution of happiness, like we saw in the last lesson where we have sad me, unhappy me, and silly happy me. Okay. If we go out and do a straightforward random sample, think about this, we're going to get most people in that 68% range between 1 and minus 1 standard deviations. That's just what we're going to get. And we would want to get that in a good random sample. However, our interest might really be in the sad people. We have a population of people, and they are normally distributed. But for our research project, we might want to have a representation of more sad people, because that's who we're really looking at. We want to make sure we have enough of them in our sample. So we might create a stratification where we'll take a part of our of our total sample from the whole population, and then we will take a certain number of cases in that sample, knowing then that we are making a systematic bias. We're going to take a certain number of cases from the sad people, because we want to make sure they're in that sample. That's really who we're interested in. Um, in survey for like marketing, this is very common, where if you have a product that's for people with young children, you might go out to a mall or someplace and interview people who come up to you, but you're going to want to go after and interview those people with small children. That's a very common practice. And that might sound like you're not getting a true random sample, and in, in some, to some degree that's true, but at least you know 
where your bias is, where your error is coming from, and you, you're doing it for a purpose so you know what the shape of your data are. So, some refinements to sampling. Okay. So, sampling is something that really you're going to be doing when you go out and do research projects. And sort of all of the lessons in this topic have to do with how you go out and actually do design and conduct a research project. But it's important to understand these because the data we're going to be working with now for the rest of the topics come out of some research project. And we have to understand kind of the limitations, the problems that are there. And in particular, we need to understand bias and error, random error, systematic error, and how those might affect the patterns we see or the results that we get. See you next time.